Say hi, Sage. Okay, microphones are going on. Alrighty, that was Talk Recovery Radio, and uh, we had Mark Wiggins on the show just a few minutes ago. If you didn't get a chance to hear the interview that Darren just did, it was amazing. He wrote a book, Permission to Succeed. Uh, the only person who needs to give it is you. And uh, usually our authors that are on the show are about addiction issues. We, uh, Jordan, who books are all of our guests. Awesome job, Jordan. Uh, we found this book, and uh, and it ended up relating totally to surrender and, and taking your inventory. And, and one of, he's got four points in his book. You'll have to listen to the show to uh, get all the points. One of the points, though, was like, don't dwell. And uh, that's a huge part of recovery. It's like you do your step four and you take a look at your inventory, uh, but really you move forward and you do the rest, right? You don't just sit there stuck in the problem. And that's why I really enjoy um, the recovery community that uh, New West Recovery, especially that I get to be part of, because it's all about moving forward. Like, what are you going to do about it? I remember the last time I relapsed, somebody told me, it's like, okay, nice story, but what are you going to do about it? And I was like, oh, I just want to live in my pain, you know? And <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that that light switch got turned on. And, and uh, so listen to the show. You can listen to it on our SoundCloud and on iTunes. Jordan's going to update the uh, past show. It will take him a couple of days because it is the holidays. But you can come back to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Talk Recovery Vancouver. And you're going to hear all of our past shows at TalkRecoveryRadio.com. And uh, hopefully uh, everyone's having a great holiday week. And the New Year's Eve dance is coming up in a couple of days. I think like eight days or something like that. I don't even know what day it is anymore. <laughs> but uh, check out the uh, biggest sober party in Vancouver has ever seen. It's going to be at the Anvil Center. It's called Rejuvenate. You can go to recoverydaybc.ca for tickets. They're only $25. There's a band. There's DJs. There's a child-minding area with a kid's zone. So check out the New Year's Eve party. A lot of volunteers putting a lot of work into it. And uh, it's definitely going to be a great evening in New West. Everyone's welcome. It's personal story time. Yay. Yay, personal story time. We've got Sage in the studio. Hi, Sage. Hi, thank How you are for you? having me. Yes, yay. So Sage and I, um, you know, we hang out in a town called New West. <laughs> and uh, I was like, hey, Sage, you want to be on the radio? And, of course, her first reaction was like, ah. <laughs> and uh, I had to go catch her and chase her down and force her here. So anyway, she's here now, and uh, thanks for being on our show. It takes a lot of courage uh, to um, to do what you got to do to even get into this studio, you know. And uh, you know, we we look at recovery, and it's like everybody's you know looks great, feels great, but there's a story that gets to the reason why we're doing all this and. Uh, you, we touched a little bit about it in the car right here. and So what's your story? Have you came here from where? Yeah, well, um, I, live, I live in Pitt Meadows. I live in Pitt Meadows. And, um, you know, I've, I've really, I was only in addiction. Um, it was a short time if I compare myself to other people's stories. But it's like, that's the thing. Like, I did a lot of comparing when I first cleaned up. And it's like you know, that that doesn't serve me in any way, you know, like my story is my story, my process is my process, my step work is my step work. And it's like, I, you know, comparing to myself to other people, it, it's like, this is just me. And this is, this is who I am, right. And um, so I was only in addiction for, you know, a short time, it was about two years. Um, and, you know, we're here on the downtown east side. And, and my addiction, it, it, I don't feel triggered being down here because it didn't really take me that way. It, it kind of took me in another route. Um, but you know what, like addiction, it's, it's not about, you know, like I would compare myself and be like, well, I'm not an addict. Like that's what set me apart. It's like, or I, that's how I set myself apart for a long time. I'm like, I'm not an addict because I'm not, um, you know, using this drug in this way, or I'm, I still have a roof over my head. I still, can provide for my kids and you know I'm still wearing nice clothes or I still drive a car but like 
you know, like it doesn't, those things are just things and, and really like it's about like the feelings that you feel inside and it's like, I don't care where you're from or who you are or what your DOC is, like every single addict can relate to the feelings of um, hopelessness, helplessness, the struggle, the, the, you know, feeling dead inside, completely dead inside and it's like, you know, I can, you've, I'm sure you've heard before, like, you know, we, we were dead inside, but our addiction wouldn't let us die. Right. And it's like, that's how I felt like emotionally, like I was dead and I was, I just felt like I was going through life like a zombie. And like, I, I hated myself and, um, you know, like I, I wished I was dead, you know? Well, there's that whole feeling of, I'm out of dope. You know, and yeah. it's like, now what? You know, mm -hmm. and I think that's the difference between the uh, problematic substance user and just somebody who uses cocaine on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Or somebody that just uses a little bit of drugs and, you know, has a great day. They're not like, oh, my God, I'm out. It's like, yeah, yeah. I'm out. It's time for me to go to work. Yeah. And if that's your ability, then congratulations. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, smoke all the legal weed you can. Like, mm -hmm. have fun. But there's a huge population that just simply can't do that mm -hmm. and you know narcotics even alcohol can do something to our body that it's like oh my god i'm out what am i gonna do and, mm -hmm. and so did you find it you you touched on how you you weren't on the streets mm -hmm. so it was hard for you to come to terms and that's mm -hmm. something i try to share too because i i'm part of a lot of stakeholder meetings where it's just like you really want to do an anti-stigma campaign you you need to help people like you mm -hmm. understand it's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Like one of the mm -hmm. biggest problems with addiction isn't stigma. Mm -hmm. It's denial. People deny that they have a problem mm -hmm. because like we had to crawl over about five people just to get into the door and they're shooting heroin on the steps and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Like obviously they're not in denial. Like they're on the streets using. Yeah. Um, but someone like you, you're a mom. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many kids? I have two children. My daughter, uh, she's six years old and my son is four years old. Yeah. And how old are you? And I'm 26 years old. So you're 26 years old. You're raising this young family and so forth. And you're you're suffering an addiction. What was that final moment? Because there's other women that are probably listening to this mm -hmm. show that may not be where you're at right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. What was it that you... What happened? Like, how did you change? Well, you know, I... People around me, you know, my, my, my family and my friends, they could see that there was a, a problem there long before I could see there was a problem, right? It was that denial piece. And um, I, my, my mom, she took me to the treatment center that I, I later decided to go to on my own will. Um, and I kind of did like a little walkthrough and uh, like I ignored all the signs like I was bawling my eyes out through that whole walkthrough But even still I left, left that place being like nope, I'm not an addict. I don't need this. I'm not ready Right, and um, that was a year before I actually went to the treatment center and during the course of that year So many more events ha occurred and like so much more harm was caused, you know Like um, I read the just for today yesterday and it, it talked about how whatever our DOC is like we took that with Without reservation right and it's like I depended on my DOCs and and I took that not caring who I hurt or the chaos that I was living in and um, so yeah like finally uh, by the end of that year um, I was like you know it was is 2017 and and I that was my bottom right and and I was like I can't do this anymore like I I'm either gonna go to treatment and you know try like just try or i'm gonna kill myself right because it's like every day like i had even though i have two beautiful children who need me i had no purpose to get out of bed like i saw my addiction turned my children into a burden to me like i didn't even want to be their mom anymore and, and that's the one thing society thing. doesn't get is like we will use no matter what yeah it doesn't exactly. matter how many kids we have and how big the house is yeah. or how little the house is so you did a tour of Westminster House, I assume? Yes, Westminster A year House. before you went. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so was there a moment where you're like, okay, my family's taking me to a treatment... <laughs> like, most people don't go on tours of treatment centers. Like, <laughs> they go to the zoo, they go to Canada Place, they go to, you know, they go to Peony. Yeah. They don't go to rehab centers. Yeah. Like, so 
I mean, you must have had it, and you was like, yeah, I need to stop using yeah. it. But you just was it like, I'm not. Well, like I said, it was like, I was crying the whole time, but I, and then I still was able to leave there being like, no, the party's not over yet. And like, that's just what it was. Like, it was still, it was still a party, right? You know, like I hadn't actually hit that um, emotional bottom of feeling just hopeless and like wanting to die, right? Um, I hadn't gotten myself into car accidents yet. I hadn't, you know, caused hurt and harm to my kids, you know, like I hadn't driven with them loaded yet. Like it hadn't gotten to that point yet. Finding everything you can find to not place you in yeah. that room. Yeah. Which is very common. Uh, you know, I remember doing, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too smart, I'm too pretty, yeah. I'm too ugly, I'm too yeah. small. You know, just no matter what, like the chameleon, I'll just, you know, turn into something to get me out of here. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, you might, were you happy go lucky day one of treatment or was this? You know what? I actually I was one of the people. Oh, you're one of those was, people. No, okay. So uh. I, I was admitted to treatment um on the same day as another girl, and she uh, um she actually ended up being my roommate for the short time that she was there, and she was one of those people that didn't want to be there she was flown in like from Saskatchewan, and it was an intervention. It was not on her own doing, and like me, I'm like super happy to be there like let's I just do remember, yoga yeah no like I just like, remember take your this yoga mat and... overwhelming feeling of when I finally was there I just remember this feeling of like it's okay like everything's gonna be okay like I hit my bottom it's only up from here yeah. you know and like and it and it was and like that's what I mean like I I hit my bottom so I once I went to treatment like I was willing to do like I did whatever they told me took every suggestion I didn't fight it I was willing to do whatever they said and it's like I was doing I was willing to do whatever it took in order to get myself to where I am today because I was done fighting I had completely like surrendered you know what was one of the biggest challenges you had um, in treatment? Yeah, just in life in the last six, seven months. You know, um, I found, well, like even just being in treatment and being away from my kids. And that was another big excuse that I made the first time. I was like, you know what? Like I'm, I don't want to go to treatment because I don't want to leave my kids. Well, you know what? I'm no good to them the way that I was, right? Like I was not emotionally present for them at all. And like, I, although I was always physically there for them, you know, like I just wasn't there. And like kids, like, you know, my, my kids are young, right? So like they may not understand like addiction or the, the, the traumas or the struggles, but like they know when, you know, like they can feel, they can, they can feel things. And like they know when, you know, like someone as big in their life as their mother doesn't want to be around them you know and so um making that decision to actually leave my kids it was really difficult um for all parties involved you know like um for them too but today i'm able to you know pour all my time and energy into rebuilding that connection and making up for the harms that i caused and being you know like i am not the same person obviously that i was in addiction and i'm able to to be there for them in a way that i never was able to be there for them in addiction well you can sit there and you can chase the idea of being a good mom mm -hmm. and like oh i'm not gonna i, I have to be there I, mean, I promise you know tomorrow I'll, i won't do the dope and i'll be a better mom mm -hmm. and you can chase it mm -hmm. you know and, and I know lots of women in recovery and you know they chase that for decades mm -hmm. and they lost decades mm -hmm. or you can just you know like we had our first guest on the show earlier today like change today mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. you have the power to change now mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. the more we think about changing it, we don't change yeah. and so it's like right now from day one from day on I'm going to do this and, mm -hmm. and that's what you did and it's really courageous so you know my hat's off to you that's that's something that I, I, I only wish other women and other fathers could help find that courage to be like, you know what, I'm going to step aside for a little bit mm -hmm. so I can have that better relationship later on. So that's that's amazing. So, you know, now we're today, uh, you know, you're six months into recovery. No, no, I'm no, 10 months. 10 months, ten into months into recovery, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so you're 10 months into recovery, coming on to a, a year of recovery, hopefully. Yes, yes. absolutely. So now you're you're living at home and... Yeah. and and life's gone back to normal. Yeah. You just got through Christmas. I did. I survived Christmas. But you know what? That's the thing. It's like this year, it wasn't so much of like a survival as it was just like being present and actually enjoying it and like enjoying what Christmas is actually meant to be about. It's not about like the money or the consumerism, which kills Christmas. And like yeah. the, you know, like I was just able to just be and enjoy and like 
Christmas Day, like, you know, spending it with my family and my kids. Of course, it's my, my first Christmas that I'm able to be clean and sober. And I don't know what it was, but I just felt, my heart felt so full from the love that surrounded me in the room, you know? And like, I, I left um, my mom's feeling just absolutely so overwhelmed with gratitude. And that's a feeling that overwhelms me, like not just on Christmas day, but like every day, you know? Like I just live and breathe gratitude for the life that I have and, today. And I mean, you weren't feeling like that when you were drinking. No. No? no you know what I mean? So not. this lifestyle isn't just about not drinking. Because mm -hmm. if it was just about not drinking, yeah. like, like if we yeah. just said, hey, stop drinking. Yeah. Go home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. would you have had such a great Christmas? You know? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just all about that internal change and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So there's women out there um, that may have struggled this Christmas and so forth. What advice do you give to someone that would have been in your shoes, you know, 10 months ago? Yeah. You know, and they're, they have a daughter at home or something. What, what advice yeah. do you give to moms and to, to, to women that may be using? Well... You know what, like, it's, you, you have to really accept, like, if you're feeling that absolute miserable feeling inside and just that hopelessness, like, you have to accept and do whatever it is that you need to do to overcome that. And, like, for me, that was treatment. Like, I tried cleaning up before um, w without treatment and it just... What did you try to do? Literally, all I did was stop drinking and yeah. using drugs. Yeah. But it's like I was still hanging out with the same people. Nothing changed. I was still doing all the same things. So it's like, like I needed those, the parameters of treatment and like the structure. And I needed to completely like live in a bubble for six months and then return back to my other life. Because um, it was as if my life in addiction was a circle and then my my coming out in recovery, it was a square and it just, none of my old life fit into my new life. So it's like- That's a good way of looking at Women, it. like they need to do whatever it is. And for me, like it was the, the short term um, sacrifice for the long term gratification, right? Because life today for me is so unbelievably fulfilling, but it's like, yeah, I needed to take that six months away from it in order to get there. And what about for families? So I, I want to go back to, so your family brought you to a rehab center, you know, a, over a year ago, and then you didn't stay. So there's a lot of family. I know a lot of parents watch this, hear and watch this show. Mm -hmm. And so they have loved ones that are still using. And so did your family put uh, restrictions on you? Did your family say do this or you're cut off? Because there was still that year of mm -hmm. you not going to rehab mm -hmm. and you still using and you mm -hmm. got kids and like what? Should affect because I know families that are like begging for their kids yeah. to go to rehab yeah. and they don't go. Yeah. So what did your family do? Did well, they, they had they did. They actually told me like, um, they tried giving me like an ultimatum. They're like, either you go to this treatment center, or you move in with us. And I was like, fuck that. I'm Oops. not moving back <laughs> in with my parents, right? And you know, but at the end of the day like families and parents, like you're completely powerless over your loved ones. Yeah. You can only, you know, like pray for them, try and guide them in the right direction, hope that they'll find their way. But it's like, you can't, you can't force it. You can't control it. My parents tried and it didn't work. So did you move in with them? No. No. But no. Did, okay. Watch the swearing. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it's a big piece though. So your family, cause a lot of families are being codependent, being being told they're codependent, enabling. I mean, there's a huge mess mm -hmm. of real life issues that mm -hmm. are going on in between that year. And and the sad part is, parents are stuck. They don't know what to do. Do yeah, I do I let stuck. go and watch my kid fall and, and become homeless? Mm -hmm. Like you know, do I let my do I hold on tight to and let them use in my basement? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, so you know, even though your family said, hey, if you don't stop using, you're going to have to move in with us. I mean, did that help you get towards... You know? No, none of that helped. You know, like, I had to have my own process. I had to uh, go through the things that happened to me. I had to experience, um, you know, like, like I had to completely go down that path instead of the, the right one for a little while. And it's like, that's the thing. It's like, no matter how far you go down a wrong path, it's never too late to turn around and go the other way. Right. So it's like eventually that's what I did. 
but like I had to have my own process and so does everyone else out there. Well, there's a million stories on how people find recovery. Uh, there's a million stories of success. There's a million stories of failures. You know, I really like the idea that everything works. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully you find a pathway that works for you. I believe in the 12 steps. We had somebody on the show uh, last week that uh, was all about Buddhism and, and, and recovery and it's called refuge recovery. And, you know, I, I was at, Darren was asking her questions and, and if you just replace the questions with N-A-A-A-C-A, -A -A -A, smart, life rate, mm. it's the same answers, connection, mm -hmm. community, people. Yeah. I felt like home when I got there. I, if I walked into a refuge meeting, I'd be like, you know, this is way too much meditation. Yeah. Like I'd hate it. Yeah. Uh, but the answers are all the same. So yeah. what are you doing today to um, stay in recovery, to stay grateful? Well, you know, like it's, it's, it's what I kind of touched on. It's like how, you know, like the, the analogy of the square and the circle. And it's like, I don't, I don't talk to anyone from my life in addiction. Like all of the people that I have in my life today, they continue to encourage me um, to go down the path that I'm doing that I'm on and like they support me in that path and my goals and you know like I've signed up for for I'm going um, I'm going to BCC in February and like I'm going to school like post-secondary and that's something I never wow. saw myself doing right and that's definitely something I never would have been able to do in addiction right and it's like all of the people in my life today they support me to um, just achieve more and be the best person that I can be Right. And so I think that the, the people that you surround yourself is a, a very important key piece, you know. Well, thanks for being on the show. And it's very courageous for you to do this. Hopefully it helps somebody yeah. um, and hopefully it helps somebody understand uh, how to choose a pathway and, and how to enjoy life minute by minute, day by day. And eventually years go by. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. We're talking to Sage on Talk Recovery Radio, um, and uh, we come to you live every Thursday, powered by New West Recovery, which is Last Door and Westminster House for Women. And I uh, really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you very Thank you much. For me. And don't forget about our New Year's Eve event that's taking place. Uh, it's called Rejuvenate. It's at the Anvil Center. Loads of people are going to be coming. Live music, DJs, kids zone, fashion show, drag show. There's just so much going on. Sage, you're going to be there. I'm gonna be there. Yeah, Sage is gonna be there. She told me in the car she doesn't know if she's going. I'm like, girl, you're going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for being on the show. I'm gonna hand over the mic back to Darren and to close off the show. Ooh. That's right. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Talk Recovery, Vancouver Colt Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. And uh, yeah, I mean, I always say it's it's just another day. Um, but when the holidays kick in, I think it's that time to give yourself permission to have some gratitude, to like really feel the love that, uh, that Sage was talking about that, um, you know, to actually just consciously appreciate the people in your life. And, uh, I think we can all take a clue from that and put on some good gear, dress up, you know, have yourself a party. It's Thursday afternoon. So get out there and give yourself permission to succeed, everyone. On that note, we're going to tune it off with uh, another old classic, William Bell. Every day will be like a holiday. No. Oops. Every day will be like a holiday. <laughs> Say bye. Thanks, Sage, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Darren, till next year. Happy New Year, Darren. Yes, happy New Year, We got everybody. no shows till January. Well, still tune in. Tune in, yeah. Tune in. We got Carrie playing repeats. And then we'll see you live uh, February? Uh, I think the last week of January. Last week of January. Last week of January. Nice. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, happy New, New Year. year. <clears throat> happy New Year.